Hello, everyone. Haku Maktaka Jess McCool. My name is Jess McCool. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm joining virtually from Shmewich land, also known as Santa Barbara. Kashua Paktina, Kakinalan. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I am a program associate for the Community Resilience Centers program at the California Strategic Growth Council. Thank you for tuning in for the CRC Round One application webinar series. In this video, we will be reviewing the CRC project development grants. So before we get started, if you wish to request webinar materials in, all, in an alternative format um, you need, or need translation or interpretation services, please let us know and we'll follow up to get you those materials and services. There are a few ways you can do this. Um, you can email our team inbox at crc at sgc.ca.gov, or you can click on the link in this video description and let us know in the post webinar survey. We also really quickly wanted to share ways you can connect with us and stay informed about the CRC program. Um, you can visit our webpage and in particular, in particular the CRC application materials webpage to find guidance documents and other application materials. Um, we are experiencing slight delays in updating our webpage. So while the most accurate information will be represented there, the quickest way to receive updates about the program is by signing up for our CRC email list. Uh, and you can find that link in the video description as well. As always, you can also email the team, crc at sgc.ca.gov. And although we do have someone from the team consistently monitoring this inbox, there is higher traffic than normal. So our response times are a little longer than average, but we are actively working on getting back to all of the messages we're receiving. And then if you have a question about the project development grants that isn't addressed in this video, you can submit those questions on the post webinar survey linked in the video description below, and we will follow up with you. Or you can attend an upcoming office hour session um, to engage with us in real time, um, offer up your project ideas, ask questions about the application, um, and we will share the full schedule and registration information for that, uh, those office hours later in the video. All right, so welcome to the application webinar series. So the first series, or the first video of this series was posted to the playlist already. Um, if you are new to learning about this grant program, I would recommend watching that first video as it provides a broad overview of the CRC Round 1 final guidelines and notice of funding availability. Um, the remaining three, including this one, cover more details specific to each grant type. So today we are focusing on CRC project development grants. Uh, the other two videos in this series focus on the planning grants and implementation grants. Here is our plan for the webinar today. We will start with a brief program overview, then focus in on project development grants. We'll talk about the application process and components, uh, and then we'll demo the submittable application platform and close out. So here are our objectives for today's webinar to provide program overview of the CRC round one project development grants, to review the application and components, and to offer reminders and updates about um, upcoming due dates, application materials, and office hours, and then to demo the submittable application platform. Our goal with this webinar is to help applicants um, to the program navigate through this complicated and involved process. So some of the slides later on in this presentation may seem very dense and full of information. Um, this is solely for your use, and we encourage you to move through this video at your own pace using the time codes below to navigate to different sections of the videos and pause whenever you need. All right, so I'm gonna pause here and let the rest of the team introduce themselves. I'll pass to Dora first. Hi everyone, my name is Dora Monterosa. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a CRC program analyst, joining virtually today from Nissan on Land, also called Sacramento, California. And I'll go ahead and pass it to Lisa Hu next. Hi everyone, Lisa Hu, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a CRC program analyst, joining virtually from Ohlone Land, also called Oakland. Coral? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Coral Abbott. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a, the CRC program manager, joining virtually from Nissan Onland, also known as Sacramento, California. And I will Hi everyone. Oh. Hi everyone, my name is Angel de Dios. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a CRC, CRC intern, I'm joining virtually from Kumaye Land, also known as Calexico, California. All right, um, also a quick notice is that we have another team member who was unable to join us today, um, Jessica Cervantes, a CRC program associate and based in East Los Angeles. And I'll present the next section, which is the CRC program overview. 
Um, we will start with the brief overview of the program, zoom into the project development grants, including the application process, the components, and then we will share the screen to show you around the submittal application platform and then close out with some final reminders about office hours and the program timeline. So here's a breakdown of the funding break uh, for, for round one. Um, SGC received around $110 million through the general fund in the current budget year to implement the program. This includes grants, staff to work on the program, um, technical assistance, and evaluation. Of the total funds, $98.6 million will be available for round one grants. A total of $5 million will be available for CRC planning grants, each ranging from $100,000 to $500,000. Planning grants will fund communities and in initial stages of a CRC project development that needs funds for plan development, community engagement, coordination, and other activities necessary to prepare for CRC rounds two and three and other related funding streams. A total of $9.6 million will be available for CRC project development grants. These grant awards each range from $500,000 to $5 million. Project development grants will fund pre-development and basic infrastructure activities that advance community, community serving facilities, ability to serve as a future community resilience center, and prepare grantees for CRC rounds two and three, and other related funding opportunities. A total of $84 million will be available for CRC implementation grants, each ranging from $1 million to $10 million. Implementation grants will fund new construction upgrades of facilities to serve as community resilience centers, as well as services and programs that build overall community resilience. So we're going to go and over uh, our overall approach is pulled from a combination of requirements from statute uh, priorities we heard over during initial listening sessions, the public comment period, stakeholder meetings and interviews, advice from folks uh, with experience developing resilience centers or hubs. Here's a quick overview. We're going to build community uh, of climate resilient and community resilience, prioritize community serving locations, require community engagement and collaborative stakeholder structure. And the purpose of the collaborative stakeholder structure is to form a local, diverse, multi-stakeholder partnership to foster long-term investment in the community's vision for transformation. The CSS, the CSS should include local residents and community-based organizations, also known as CBOs, and lead the governance and decision-making for the project. Um, balance shorter-term and longer-term needs, um, both during the during emergencies in year-round programming to enhance community resilience. Prioritize most vulnerable and, um, and priority populations. And lastly but not least, to fund a mix of projects in terms of climate impacts, facility types and lead applicants, and geographic diversity, spanning rural and urban communities, as well as incorporated and unincorporated communities. Now we're going to go into the components, uh, the core components that come in to the CRC model. The CRC model is intentionally flexible to account for the vast spectrum of community across California. Um, core components, however, include the following. Multi-stakeholder multi partnerships, which per statute include local, uh, would include local residents and community-based organizations and governments and decision-making. Robust, meaningful, and culturally appropriate community engagement through all phases, design, application, implementation, and evaluation. Capital projects, referring to the physical infrastructure investments to CRC facility itself and CRC campuses amen am amenities like a bus stop or a community garden. Community resilience services and programs, referring to social infrastructure investments and services to ensure ongoing year-round usage of the CRC while strengthening of local community resilience. Equipped with these com core components, community resilience centers will empower communities to respond to climate emergencies and provide year-round services and programs to enhance both climate resilience and community resilience. Now we'll go on to priority com communities. All communities are eligible to apply for the CRC program. We are, uh, we are directed per statute to priorita prioritize projects located in and benefiting under-resourced communities, which is a set definition in statute code and state code. The map pictured here highlights all the uh, under-resourced communities in blue, as you can see. We added language to make very clear that tribal lands, unincorporated communities, and rural communities that meet the definition of under-resourced communities qualify as priority communities for the CRC program. All applicants must discuss if and how their proposal considers, involves, impacts, and benefits priority communities. So priority, com 
priority populations in alignment with the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, Cal OS, and other state agencies, the CRC has identified the following priority population. Individuals with physical, developmental, or intellectual disabilities, individuals with chronic conditions or injuries, individuals, individuals with limited English proficiency, older adults, children, and pregnant folks, low-income, unhoused homeless, and or transportation disadvantaged or public trans transit dependent people. Each CRC proposal must identify, work with, and intentionally serve the needs of priority populations in the proposed neighborhood containing the CRC facilities. Now we're gonna go to the finding targets. We have two types of funding targets. To meet the statewide geographic diversity required by statute, the program commits to awarding at least one CRC grant, any grant type, to each of the Cal OES fire and rescue mutual aid programs. Here's a map of the six regions to the left. Um, we, can, we also have tribal funding target. We intend to fund a minimum of five qualifying tribally led CRC projects in round one across all grant types. And now, I will pass it on to Elisa to talk about the project development grants. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Angel. So I will be covering and helping us get into more details on the project development grants. Great. So the CRC project development grants are a great fit for applicants with an identified existing facility requiring basic infrastructure and pre-development investment. Project development grants will prioritize projects from rural, tribal, and disadvantaged unincorporated communities. And project development grants, um, the award ranges range from $500,000 to $5 million each. Next slide, please. So at a very high level, these are the program objectives for the project development grants to advance the development of sites identified by local residents for use as a community resilience center that builds climate resilience and community resilience, both during emergencies and year round, to construct climate resilient infrastructure to ensure or improve accessibility of CRCs to community members or strengthen local community resilience in connection with a proposed CRC, and finally, to demonstrate consistency with the state's planning priorities contained in section 65041.1 of government code. And those priorities, just in case you're curious, intend to promote equity, strengthen the economy, protect the environment, pr promote public health and safety in the state, including urban, suburban, and rural communities. Next slide, please. Great, so uh, consistent with the other grant types, there's very broad eligibility for applicants and facility types for project development grants. CRCs will serve as resilience centers, both during specific climate or emergency events, as well as provide ongoing programming and community services year round. So examples of existing community serving locations include, but are not limited to some of the ones that are on this slide. Schools, libraries, community centers and cultural centers, youth and or senior centers, health clinics, places of worship, community colleges, food banks, and many more. Um, and regardless of facility type, applicants more importantly must demonstrate how that facility serves or could serve the local community, both during emergency activations and year round during non-emergencies. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So CRC facilities and any campus amenities associated with that CRC facility must be publicly accessible year round. Project development grant applications must include an existing facility for retrofits. And please note that new construction projects are not eligible for CRC project development grants. Applications may include more than one facility that serves as a CRC provided that all facilities included in the application have the same owner. Next slide, please. Great, so all applicants do need to be based in California and they can include all of the following on this slide. I'll just do a, a quick skim. There's a lot more detail in the guidelines. California Native American tribes, coalitions or associations of nonprofit organizations, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations and non-governmental organizations, community development finance institutions or community development corporations, emergency management response, preparedness and recovery service providers and other organizations, philanthropic organizations and foundations, private or nonprofit, 
private sector and consultants with some additional safeguards in place, public entities, which can include some of the ones we just saw on the previous slide, schools and public libraries, uh, incorporated cities, counties, including unincorporated communities, local regional public agencies and districts at the county level, including, for example, community choice aggregators, other kinds of special districts, uh, joint powers authorities, councils of governments, and other forms of local government, and small business. And just want to asterisk that some of those um, types of entities may have some additional um, requirements in place. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So these are some of those additional requirements. So if the lead applicant is a public agency, they must provide evidence of a past formal resolution in the CRC proposal that includes an authorization to apply for and accept a CRC project development grant and the authority to execute all related documents if awarded. There are sample resolution letters available in the application itself on submittable. If the public agency is a co-applicant, then the applicant must provide a letter of support from that agency in the CRC proposal. And there's, again, further guidance on this included in the application itself. If the lead applicant is a private entity, including private sector or consultants, private philanthropic organizations, other for-profit entities, that lead applicant must one, partner with a community-based organization or tribe that advances climate, racial, economic, or health justice and works with that specific community the CRC intends to serve. And secondly, they need to submit a letter of recommendation from that community-based organization or tribe detailing the history of interaction, collaboration, and outcomes. We do want to note that state entities, uh, such as agencies, departments, commissions, offices, councils, and interstate compact entities, they're not able to apply as a lead applicant, but state entities are eligible as co-applicants. So for example, the University of California and California State University Systems are actually exempt from this guidance and they can apply as the lead applicant where appropriate. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So it is required for project development grant applicants to form a collaborative stakeholder structure, which is formalizing localized place-based partnerships to ensure consistent buy-in and support, shared values and governance, and alleviation of existing power imbalances that may skew input and decisions, especially under time and resource constraints or emergency conditions. Collectively, that collaborative stakeholder structure will provide support for public engagement and drive decision making through project implementation. The collaborative stakeholder structure is designed to overcome challenges inherent in the shared decision making to build robust local community governance over projects happening in residents owned neighborhoods. That collaborative stakeholder structure will develop and submit one application. The CSS must involve multi-stakeholder partnerships and include local residents and community-nominated members and community-based organizations like community-based uh, like CBOs. The application will be evaluated on the degree to which they incorporate community leadership, especially in decisions like site selection, proposal development, and project design, implementation, and evaluation. We do we are required to do that per statute. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, in terms of the project area, uh, there needs to be for project development grants at least one existing facility required at the time of application. The project area must encompass the CRC facility, campus amenities connected to the CRC facility, and community resilience services and programs based out of that CRC facility. Those campus amenities, as listed on the slide, must be on the same parcel as the Resilience Center or an adjoining parcel of a CRC or be within a one mile radius of a CRC and along a route that is accessible to pedestrians or individuals using wheelchairs or other mobility devices or accessible by vehicle by the end of the grant term. Applications that include more than one CRC facility must explain how the separate facilities uh, will serve distinct communities within their region. Transportation to and from the CRC may extend beyond the limits of that identified project area. And we do wanna note that tribal projects located on restricted fee lands must comply with the requirements of the jurisdiction on which the land is located. Next slide, please. Great. So eligible project development activities under this grant type include the following. 
uh, general pre-development phase activities, which can include things like community engagement, feasibility studies, market analysis, environmental assessments, surveys and remediation, site acquisition, site and pre-development plans, uh, things like that. Pre-development construction and development of long-term operations and maintenance plans for critical utility infrastructure, which can include connections and upgrades to the following kinds of systems. Drinking water, wastewater, waste disposal, pollution control services, energy infrastructure and grid connectivity, broadband or fiber connections, basic infrastructure pre-development, construction and planning for infrastructure to develop, protect, and uh, access evacuation routes to and from CRC sites. Local project planning activities that prepare community pr prioritized project sites for development and future activation as CRCs, including but not limited to the development of a CRC emergency plan and CRC year round community resilience plan. Those are elements inside of our implementation grants, for example, and also support costs to build and sustain local capacity of project leads and partners. You just want to note here that applicants must include community engagement activities and address climate resilience in the proposal. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So there are, of course, some ineligible costs that we also want to highlight. So um, indirect costs in excess of 12% of the awarded CRC funds would be ineligible, with the exception of federally recognized Native American tribes who may use the indirect cost rate negotiated directly with the federal government. Other indirect costs, uh, or sorry, other ineligible costs include expenses and activities incurred outside the grant award term. We are unable to use CRC funds to pay for fossil fuel powered uh, appliances and infrastructure like diesel generators or gas powered appliances. You cannot use CRC funds to supplant other committed funds for any part of the proposal. And while many engagement related costs like food, childcare, and transportation costs are eligible, we can't pay for the following outreach costs, which include direct cash benefits, subsidies, or participant incentives. We cannot pay for projects without long-term operations and maintenance plans. Um, and you can find a full list of the ineligible costs in the CRC Round 1 Final Guidelines, Section 7.1, Eligible and Ineligible Costs, which starts on page 50, uh, sorry, 35. Wonderful. Finally, uh, indirect costs may account for up to 12% of the total CRC grant award, as I mentioned. That 12% maximum of indirect costs applies to all entities, including the University of California or UC and California State University CSU entities, again, except for those federally recognized Native American tribes who may use the indirect cost rate negotiated with the federal government. Indirect costs are costs of doing business that are of a general nature, and these costs are not directly tied to the grant, but are necessary for the general operation of the organization. Indirect costs include, but are not limited to, personnel costs associated with administrative, supervisory, legal, and executive staff, personnel costs associated with support units, including clerical support, housekeeping, et cetera, and operating expenses and equipment costs not included as part of direct project costs. For example, functions such as accounting, budgeting, audits, business services, information technology, janitorial, rent, utilities, supplies, things like that. Documentation related to the determination of the grantee's indirect cost rate must be retained by the grantee for audit purposes. And now I will pass to Dora to cover program thresholds. Thanks, Lisa. All right, so this next section uh, will outline the five components detailing threshold requirements for the CRC project development grants. Next slide, please. So they include the community engagement and outreach, partnership and our memorandum of understanding, site readiness, applicant capacity, which is both management and financial capacity, long-term use of the CRC facility is that fifth one. Upon submission of a full application, each application must meet all thresholds to advance from the program thresholds screen onto the interagency review panel. Next slide, please. For community engagement, applicants must demonstrate how community residents and CBOs informed project proposals and selected the project area, as well as how they will remain engaged throughout project design, application, implementation, and evaluation phases. To ensure that 
grant funds provide direct, meaningful, and assured benefits to under-resourced communities, the CRC program requires that applicants work with community members and stakeholders through direct engagement. Applicants must involve residents, organizations, and businesses from the project area and key stakeholders in all phases of CRC proposal development and implementation. CRC proposals should be designed to meet residents' needs that are identified through a documented outreach and engagement process. Applicants must tailor community engagement to their local community through partnerships with local CBOs. Applicants must also prove, uh, use proven methods of engagement to facilitate direct participation of community residents, including ensuring translation of meetings and materials, scheduling meetings at times that are convenient to community members to attend, and engaging community members in information gathering as well as outreach. Next slide, please. So our partnerships agreements and or MOUs section. Um, for partnership agreements, applicants must submit a partnership agreement that is co-developed by the lead applicants and all the co-applicants that describes the governance, organization, and financial relationships of the collaborative stakeholder structure. The partnership agreement can be submitted as an unsigned draft. If awarded, SGC may request changes to the terms of the partnership agreement during the post-award consultation process. The partnership agreement will need to be executed before the grant agreement is signed. The, co the collaborative stakeholder structure will govern implementation of the entire CRC grant. Applicants whose proposals contain more than one CRC facility must still be governed by one collaborative stakeholder structure, although the specific partners operating at each site may vary. For memorandum of understanding, uh, or MOUs for multiple jurisdictions, any applicant whose project area crosses municipal boundaries, federally recognized tribal territory boundaries, or similarly relevant jurisdictional boundaries is required to submit a draft MOU that outlines how all public agencies and tribal governments who collectively have jurisdiction over the entire project area will effectuate and manage the grant. Applicants may, may either submit an MOU separate from the required partnership agreement that outlines the collaborative stakeholder structure or submit an all-encompassing MOU that defines the governance structure for both the CRC project area with multiple jurisdictions and the CRC collaborative stakeholder structure. Next slide, please. For site readiness, readiness requirements for project development grants ensure that proposed infrastructure components can be constructed within the grant term. Site control um, is really applicants where applicants must demonstrate site control to demonstrate readiness prior to implementation. Applicants that want to establish facilities or expand existing facilities on property not owned by the applicant must prove a legally binding, must provide a legally binding commitment or a letter of commitment to sell that clearly states the ownership or leasehold interests of the parties. For more information on this, you can take a look at Appendix E, Site Control for methods applicants may use to demonstrate the site control. Permits. At the time of application, applicants must identify all permits required to implement all proposed components of the application and that the permits can be obtained within the grant term. In terms of the resolution, uh, if the lead applicant is a public agency, they must provide evidence of a past formal resolution in the CRC proposal that includes an authorization to apply for and accept a CRC project development grant and delegated authority to execute all related documents if awarded. There are sample resolution letters available in the application itself on submittable, uh, which we'll be able to show you later on in this video. Operations and maintenance plan. Uh, all applications must, all applicants must also submit an operations and maintenance plan. This must detail indebtedness for all properties included in the CRC application. There is an operation and maintenance plan template also available inside of the application and submittable. Next slide, please. For next, we'll cover applicant capacity. Each lead and co-applicant must provide a letter of commitment and describe the full or part-time staff that are dedicated to planning in the proposed work plan and budget. There is a workbook template that includes the work plan and the budget available in the application on submittable. Applicants that include construction of basic infrastructure must provide sufficient information to demonstrate their management and financial capacity. 
lead and co-applicants must demonstrate the ability to oversee, manage, and implement large infrastructure projects. In terms of management capacity, to demonstrate management capacity, the lead and co-applicants must provide evidence to the lead entity having successfully implemented a similar project within the last 10 years. It must describe the full or part-time staff dedicated to implementation and provide a letter of support from one reference who can speak to the quality and timeliness of work completed by that lead entity. For financial capacity, lead applicants and co-applicants must possess the financial capacity to adhere to the reimbursement processes of the CRC program and defined by the partnership agreement. For more information there, you can see section 10.4 in our final guidelines, uh, disbursements and accounting of funds for details around that reimbursement process. To demonstrate financial capacity, the lead and co-applicants must provide a current annual organizational budget and recent financial statements as specified in the application. Nonprofit organizations must submit a copy of their most recent federal form 990 and a copy of the organization's IRS 501c3 tax determination letter. Any applicant that had an audit finding in the last five years is required to enclose it in the application in an official letter. Next slide, please. Next, we'll go ahead and go into long-term use of the facility. Grantees whose projects include an infrastructure component must provide a legally binding document by the end of the grant term that demonstrates the facility's dedicated use as a com community serving facility for a minimum of 15 years after project implementation is complete. Applicants must either provide a recorded deed restriction or a Memorandum of Unrecorded Grant Agreement, or a MUGA, M-O-U-G-A. Leased facilities must provide both a copy of the lease and a signed letter of commitment from the landowner, giving permission to develop the proposed project and provide long-term maintenance as applicable, satisfactory to the SGC. I will now pass to Coral to talk about the application. Wonderful, thanks so much, Dora. Um, so all CRC grants are going to be evaluated and awarded through a competitive process. Applications will be submitted electronically. All applications and submitted materials will be treated in accordance with the Public Records Act requirements and certain information subject to those requirements will be publi publicly disclosed, sorry about that, if anyone requests it. So just want to make sure you know, if somebody does request details on applications, we are legally required to share whatever is in your application. Next slide, please. So one eligible entity on behalf of the collaborative stakeholder structure will complete a CRC project development application and submit the materials to SGC. CRC staff will evaluate applications to ensure that they're both eligible and complete. Staff will then evaluate applications using the program thresholds that are, have been listed out previously. Um, applicants will then have a brief window to resubmit any missing information that is flagged by CRC program staff. If an applicant is unable to meet the program thresholds, their proposal will not proceed to the next step of the review process. If a proposal does meet all program thresholds, program staff and an interagency review panel will evaluate the proposal using the scoring criteria, which I'll go over in just a moment. Um, applicants will receive a single score out of 93 points. Staff will recommend awards based on these scores. Um, and then applicants who have met program thresholds may be invited to an interview with CRC program staff and potentially members of the interagency review panel as well. Based on the interagency review of the applications and interviews, staff will finalize and prepare award recommendations to present to the SGC council members for final approval. Final funding decisions will be subject to programmatic considerations, including diversity of project types and geographic locations, um, including but not limited to variety of climate impacts, representation from rural and urban, and incorporated and unincorporated communities. The Strategic Growth Council will make final awards at a council meeting. Next slide, please. The completed application for CRC project development grants must include information on local community and residents, especially priority communities, priority populations, and other vulnerable residents, 
um, provide a summary of local climate risks, exposures, and adaptation and resilience measures, provide a summary of local community resilience, and provide a summary of community engagement to date, including descriptions of type, quality, depth, methods that have been used, and any previous data or work developing a plan. In addition to the completed application, a lead applicant must also submit the following um, set of documents that is here. Um, you can see this full list of application components for the project development grants in the CRC Round 1 Final Guidelines, Section 9.2, Application Components on page 51. Um, please also feel free to screen capture this slide to use as an informal checklist or guide to reference as you're developing and submitting application materials. Uh, we also have application TA available, although um, that has mostly been assigned out at this point. We'll um, cover that elsewhere. Um, and CRC project development grants will have a grant term of two years with an option to extend on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide, please. So now we're going to get into the scoring criteria. CRC project development grant proposals will be scored out of a total of 93 points according to the following criteria. We did notice a point discrepancy in scoring criteria specifically for project development grants. So the table that is on this slide is pulled from the corrected section in the amended versions uh, of the guidelines. Um, so the contact with strike throughs on this slide were edited to reflect the correct amounts, which are underlined and in red text. And so to just verbally explain, we've updated the headers in the guidelines to align with the more detailed scoring criteria originally included in the guidelines. So as far as the individual scoring criteria that was already in the guidelines, none of that has changed. We just updated the headers and this table to align with those. Next slide, please. So for the first section of scoring criteria, um, vision and objectives, this is worth five points. Um, we want to see first that the project area is clearly defined and that the sites are, are identified. An important piece to note is that for project development grant um, applications, there needs to be an existing facility on the site. It can't be an empty site slated for new construction down the road. Um, and then we also want to see the vision statement that it reflects project development grant program objectives and the overall approach. Um, and also that proposed activities effectively advance those program objectives and, of course, that they're eligible as well. Next slide, please. So the community profile and engagement um, plan is worth eight points total. We want to see here a clear and compelling description of the local community, any community engagement that has been done to date, and then the proposed community engagement plan for the grant term. Within Submittable, there is a community engagement plan template that you will need to download, fill out, and then re-upload to the Submittable platform. Um, this portion should especially focus on outreach engagement and improved outcomes for priority communities and priority populations, which we detailed earlier in the webinar. Next slide, please. So capacity, this is again looking more specifically at ensuring that the lead applicant has the financial and organizational capacity to manage the grant and see it through successfully during the grant term. Please. Project impact is worth 28 points total. It's first going to look at for 10 points the demonstrated need or value of proposed strategies and activities, including demonstration of building both climate resilience and community resilience through anticipated project benefits and outcomes. Um, for this section, you will need to provide a baseline by using CalAdapt's local climate change snapshot tool um, to provide information on your site or sites. We do have a guidance document for this on the application materials page. Um, but other than this, it also needs to include any um, relevant local data that you have as well. So include the CalAdapt information, but layer in any additional data that is helpful to understanding um, the context of your community and specific site in terms of climate risks, 
exposures and adaptation and resilience measures. And then we also want to see evidence of how proposed activities will meet the program objectives for 10 points. Uh, for project development grants, this is looking at advancing the development of CRC sites, ensuring or improving access to a CRC, and strengthening local community resilience in connection with a proposed CRC. And then finally in this section for eight points, we want to see that the proposed work plan provides clear, a clear comprehensive plan with activities that are focused on the proposed project area and site. Next slide, please. So project design and feasibility and additional points, we kind of collapse these two together. So first project design and feasibility. Um, we have a number of subsections in here. The first one is worth five points, wanting to see that the overall project design and feasibility are clear, relevant, and appropriate given the vision statement program objectives, that specific site, and that specific community. And then also worth five points, we want to see a demonstrated ability to complete all site readiness requirements and thresholds by program deadlines. Uh, worth 10 points, we want to see that the timeline and budget provide a clear understanding of community strengths, technical needs, and proposed activities. And then worth five points, uh, want to see demonstration of financial sustainability of the CRC, including operations and maintenance costs and uh, services and programs if applicable. So how you are going to show long term use of the facility. Um, and then again, worth five points, demonstrated ability to directly meet readiness requirements to apply for subsequent rounds of the program should additional funding become available for future rounds. And then in the additional points category, one point to proposals located in and benefiting priority communities, and one point to proposals located in and benefiting disadvantaged unincorporated communities. I think that might be a typo, apologies. Um, that should say disadvantaged unincorporated communities there tribal communities and or rural communities. Next slide, please. Um, and then finally, the sharing plan, um, worth five points. We want to see your plan for creating a replicable and useful um, way to share your project with other communities. Um, so how your project might be duplicated by others and how you plan to potentially share that out. And next slide. Okay, so moving on to grant administration. Um, project development grant terms are two years with the option to extend that grant term on a case-by-case -case basis. Project um, development grants will be executed between SGC and the lead applicant only. Um, and grant agreements for CRC projects where the lead applicant is a federally recognized Native American tribe will include language giving SGC a right to sue the tribe for breach of the grant agreement in California state courts. Next slide, please. So for disbursement and accounting of funds, we have two mechanisms. The first is advance payment. So SGC may provide advance payments to qualifying awardees to ensure effective implementation of the program. Advance payments can be up to 25% of the total grant award spread across a series of installments between the start date identified in the grant agreement up until June 30th, 2025. Uh, the complete schedule process and reporting requirements for advance pay will be determined in the grant agreement. And then per CRC, the CRC program's specific advance pay authority, advance payment will be limited to the service portions of award of awards when the grantee is a community-based private nonprofit agency. Um, that includes, but might not be limited to community-based organizations and non-governmental organizations. Um, so important to note there is that government entities, including city and county government and federally recognized tribes are not eligible for advance payment. All grantees that are eligible for advance payment will be required to prioritize partners that experience low cash reserves to receive advances. Um, for more information on this, see section 10.4, Disbursement and Accounting of Funds in the CRC Round 1 Final Guidelines um, for additional detail there. So moving into the disbursement process, uh, the grantee can't request advance payment or reimbursement for any costs incurred 
or work completed before the grant agreement is executed. So if you're awarded, we can't reimburse any work that occurs before the grant agreement is signed. Um, grantees can request advance payment or reimbursement from SGC for project development grants on a quarterly basis, so every three months. SGC will retain the last 5% of the overall grant budget to be paid once the state has determined that all of the grant terms have been fulfilled. For reimbursement payments, partners have to invoice the grantee before the grantee submits an invoice to SGC. So those would be the subrecipients. Um, the grantee will be responsible for compiling all invoices, supporting documentation, and reporting materials for themselves and the project partners. Um, the subrecipients into a single package. Then once the package has been approved for payment, funds will be dispersed to the grantee. The grantee is responsible for dispersing payment to partners in accordance with the signed partnership agreement. Um, and then a note that tribes won't be required to sign a limited waiver of sovereign immunity to receive payments on a reimbursement basis from SGC through the CRC program. Slide. Okay, so moving into recording requirements. Um, so first, regular check-ins. All grantees can expect to participate in regular check-in meetings with CRC staff and contractors. During these meetings, grantees can describe their work and CRC staff can offer feedback and guidance on draft deliverables. During each check-in meeting, staff will take notes on accomplishments, challenges, and lessons learned to identify any emerging trends, best practices, opportunities for greater support, and success stories. Staff and contractors will also support grantees in meeting the various administrative criteria, developing financial and grant management processes, and building connections between grantees and state and federal agencies. And then as far as frequency of these check-ins, the lead applicant as the liaison between CRC program staff and their project partners will participate in more frequent check-in meetings with CRC staff and contractors. Um, the grantee check-in meeting schedule will align with the invoicing schedule, so on that three-month basis. Partners can expect to participate in two full collaborative check-ins each grant year. Next slide, please. So additional reporting requirements. Progress reports. In addition to regular check-in, grantees will need to submit annual progress reports that provide updates on the overall status of the grant. These will include high-level questions that are not captured in the regular check-ins. And then grantees will also need to submit a final report on the overall status of the grant, including lessons learned, barriers, and success stories. As far as budget reports go, um, we will need to see an inventory of purchased equipment be reported annually and then at the end of the grant term. Detailed work plans and budgets um, can be revised on a regular basis. Um, these documents will contain more detail than the grant agreement and will be used as administrative tracking tools between the grantee and the state. And then finally here, reporting templates and forms. SGC will provide templates for the progress reports, the work plan, budget, invoicing form, advance payment request form, and the reimbursement request forms. These documents will record the project expenditures and assess general progress on deliverables. Next slide, please. So CRC funded projects may be subject to state prevailing wage requirements pursuant to section 1700 of the California Labor Code. Um, grantees need to ensure that anywhere, any part of the application that includes public work activities, which under the project development grant type would be anything involving construction, so anything around those basic infrastructure construction components, um, prevailing wage law would apply. Um, so this includes prevailing wages must be paid, the project budget and invoices for labor has to reflect prevailing wage requirements, or if it's exempt, um, the applicable exemption has to be provided to SGC with the project budget. And then the project needs to comply with all other requirements of prevailing wage law, including but not limited to keeping accurate payroll records and complying with all working hour requirements and apprenticeship obligations. 
The grantee needs to ensure that its partners and subcontractors, if they have any, also, in, com also comply with prevailing wage requirements. Next slide, please. So the final grant administration sections are ownership. So this is around equipment, vehicles, and infrastructure, publicity requirements, audit and record retention, and performance. I won't go into detail on all of these right now, but if you want to read further and understand these requirements, um, take a look at sections 10.7 through section 10.10 .10 of the guidelines to do a deeper dive on these. Um, and that is all for our project development grant. So I will now pass to Jess to share about the application resources and materials that we have on our website. Great, thank you, Coral. Uh, we do have a lot of resources available to learn about the CRC program and develop your application. So let's get into it. Um, all of the program resources and materials can be found on the CRC resources page. Uh, you can find this uh, page by navigating to the button on the CRC webpage that says CRC resources. Um, the, the blue arrow is pointing to it here on the screen. So if you click on that button, it will take you to our CRC resources page. Across the top, you will see these three main buckets, program information, program guidelines, and application materials. Um, the CRC team will be hosting office hours throughout the application window to support applicants. Um, you can find the full office hour schedule and registration information underneath the buckets across the top. Um, and then at the very bottom is a program timeline that we'll cover briefly in a moment. So in the most left bucket, program information, um, the top button takes you directly to the program's fact sheet. This gives a high level um, at a glance summary of the program. Also in this bucket, you can find a CRC grant type guide which helps applicants identify which grant type would be the best fit for them in their communities. And a web page of frequently asked questions with answers um, with questions and answers about the program. In the center bucket, program guidelines, the button takes you to a separate page where you can find the CRC round one final guidelines, a staff report and memo, along with the first video of the series, the CRC round one final guidelines and NOPA webinar. And then in the most right bucket, application materials, there are two buttons, round one app materials and round one application TA. Uh, the application TA button takes you to a separate page that tells you about our application TA program. And while we are offering uh, technical assistance and the request form remains open until early August in the event that more resources become available, there's not a high likelihood of TA resources being available to accommodate additional requests at this time. So that first button, round one app materials, will have the majority of resources and materials you will need for your application. Once you open this, it takes you to the CRC application materials page that we referenced a few times in the application itself. Um, and this is where you can find the link to the application itself on the submittable platform, guidance documents, the notice of funding availability, intent to apply survey, which is optional and will remain open throughout the application period. And then the full application webinar series can be found there as well. So at the top of the CRC application materials page, you will find the button that takes you to the grant application on the submittable platform. Um, the section underneath that is where you can find guidance documents that will be useful to reference as you're developing your applications. Um, the project area mapping guide will be useful to project development uh, grant applicants and will hopefully be released when this video is posted. You can see the note at the bottom there, um, but yes, hopefully it, it is updated there soon. And just as a reminder, all CRC grant applications are due on September 18th, 2023 by 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, and so I think we're gonna um, stop sharing now and do a demo of our submittable application um, platform. All right, so um, here is our demo of the submittable application platform. Um, here's the landing page on Submittable. You can get here by clicking on that button on the CRC application materials web page that we just showed you. I've opened up the project development grant application by clicking on the submit, the blue submit button next to the project development grant. Um, this provides a high level summary of the project development grants and shares where to find more information about the CRC program. Again, you can go to the web page, review the guidelines, grant type guide, and all, all other application materials on the CRC application materials page. Um, and they're all linked here in this top um, bulleted list. Then we see the due date again. 
Um, all CRC project development grants are due via submittable by no later than 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on Monday, September 18th, 2023. All applicants must complete all the required sections of the online form via submittable. They must download, complete, and re-upload required application components with the appropriate naming convention. Um, these are clearly defined in the application. We'll give you examples of how to rename your documents. And um, another example of something that you might have to download, complete, and then re-upload would be things like the community engagement plan, the workbook with the work plan and budget, um, the partnership agreement is another example. And then of course, reference other CRC application materials is relevant on the CRC application materials webpage that is also linked right here. So before you begin, um, here are just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, once you create a submittable account to begin a specific CRC grant type application, in this case, a project development grant, you can share your login credentials with other partners to work on a shared application. Submittable allows you to save progress along the way, so you can begin and come back to the application over time. If you decide to instead apply for a different CRC grant type, for example, you switch from project development to planning grant, you will have to begin a new application in the new project. So you'd have to start a new planning grant application and re-enter your information. So if you have questions about Submittable, you can also contact their helpline. They're extremely helpful and will be able to answer any questions you might have about the application. You can also contact us um, and email our team inbox again. As you work on your application, please keep in mind, instructions are included throughout this application on how to complete the, plan, uh, the project development grant application. Uh, it says planning grant application right here, but this is the project development grant application. Um, additional reference documents to support the development of your application can be found on that application materials webpage that I referenced. Um, and application TA is offered on a competitive prioritized basis, but like we mentioned, due to limited resources, um, these requests were due on June 23rd, um, and while the form still remains open until early August, it is highly unlikely that we'll have any remaining resources to accommodate additional requests. Uh, and then CRC staff and the TA provider will assign which applicants receive TA. CRC program staff are creating um, online videos detailing each grant type. This is one of them. So you can reference the videos in this series to better understand each specific grant type. And additionally, we are hosting virtual office hours throughout the application window. So now until September 14th, I believe is our last one. Um, so we invite interested applicants, if you have any other questions to come attend one of our office hours and engage with us, ask questions, share project ideas, and meet other applicants. Um, and you can see that full office hour schedule and register on the resources page also linked right here. And then just wanna share, given the lag time on website updates, um, you can email crc at sgc.ca.gov for the fastest, most accurate, and most tailored guidance from the CRC program team. Um, but due to high volume of interest, emailing the team inbox is recommended and typically faster than emailing individual staff members. So then underneath, you've got a little note from us, our team. We're very excited to start reviewing applications and support applicants in this process. So thank you so much for your interest. So really quickly, just wanna go through this process on how to invite team members to collaborate on your application. So you can click on manage collaborators here towards the top right corner of the screen. <clears throat> It'll then open this box, a dialog box will appear asking you to enter the email address uh, or addresses of your collaborators. You can enter the addresses, then click invite. It will send it to them. So I've sent one to Coral and it's pending. So you can see the status here as well. Um, invited collaborators will receive an email letting them know that you have invited them to collaborate on a draft submission using Submittable. In order to communicate with collaborators through the Submittable platform, all invitees must accept the invite before the owner of the submission, which is most likely you, um, hit submit. So after you have sent invitations to collaborate, you can click on the invite collaborators link again or this manage collaborators at the top that I clicked on um, to see the status of your invitations. In the row for each invitee who has not yet accepted their invitations, you'll see the pending indication, which is what we just saw with Coral's invite right over here. Uh, there will also be a trash can next to each person's name so that the submission owner can remove anyone that they no longer want to collaborate on the submission with. And then you can click on this link that's highlighted in red um, for more information on how to collaborate with someone else on a submission. 
So now just kind of going through uh, the application, we have our section one, which are general application questions. Um, the questions and fields to upload documents are marked with an asterisk, as, asterisk and are required. Um, and all required fields will also have response required text below the question. Um, so I'm just gonna make my way through here. A lot of this is self-explanatory. You see all the asterisks. Um, we also have character limits. So please keep that in mind as you are um, submitting your responses. We do reference the guidelines. You can click on these links and it will take you to the direct sections that we reference in our guidelines. And then I wanted to also pull um, maybe one of our downloadable templates just to show you. So here's a good example. So the application workbook, um, we have our instructions, we have our kind of general guidance for this um, requirement. Um, we have our references, and then we do have our template here. So I'm going to open this in a new tab. All right. Perfect. Can you see that all right, Dora? Yes, that looks good. Okay, cool. All right, so open it in a new tab. And that will be the workbook that you download. You can complete it on your own and then you'll rename it and you'll re-upload it. And then that naming convention will be right here um, on that third, number three. Yeah, right there. Oh, I knew that was gonna happen. Uh, okay, perfect. All right, so um, that's an example of one of the downloadable templates that we do offer within the application itself to hopefully help you out while you are um, developing the required documentation. So that's just our workbook that includes the work plan and the template that we were saying. It has the appropriate naming convention. And then here below is the field that you would upload it as. We have our acceptable file types there. Um, and like I said, the response is required. So it does indicate that as well right there. Right there. So then you just make your way through the document. We have all of our eligibility questions. These will be screening to make sure that you have an eligible applicant type and eligible facility type. I did wanna note here as well on facility eligibility. Um, so for example, this first question asks, does your proposed project site or sites include an existing facility for retrofits? Um, if you say yes, then you can continue. Um, on the application for project development grants. If you do say no, it will pop up with a message um, letting you know that project development grant applications must include an existing facility for retrofit. So new construction projects are not eligible for CRC project implementation grants. So just a note right there. All right, and then it determines your project area uh, eligibility. Like I mentioned earlier on in the webinar, the project area mapping guide is um, is not on the website as of when we recorded this, but when it's released, the project area mapping guide will be available on the CRC current application materials webpage. Oops. And then making our way down a little more, we have our site readiness, our operations and maintenance plan. This is another downloadable template that you can use. We have our indebtedness, and here just wanted to for anticipated payback rate. Just wanted to also note that the format must be month, month, slash, year, year. So for example, 0725, or no, that's not the right example, 0723, um, and must be after the date of submission of your application. So there are some more um, questions about that, about your project site operation. Um, we have our applicant capacity. So this is kind of building in those program thresholds that we were talking about earlier in the presentation. And then lastly, our section three um, have narrative questions. So this is going to be where you expand on your vision and objectives. You uh, talk about the local community, the local climate risks. Um, so that's where you can do that here. And so you have your limit of 200 words. This is 450 words. Um, so there is a lot of guidance and instructions to help you develop these, these things for us as well. And here, I believe as well, is another downloadable template, our community engagement plan template um, that you will download, complete, and re-upload using um, that naming convention found on number three. All right, so we just really uh, quickly wanted to show you how to uh, re-upload a file into this required file upload field. 
So I've downloaded the community engagement plan. Let's pretend that I've, you know, edited it to reflect my project and my community. Um, and now I have renamed it and I'm wanting to upload it again. So I will, would press the choose file button. It will open up my kind of documents, um, find the location that it's in, select it, and then click on the open. It might take a little bit to load, but it will eventually upload, perfect. And that is all. And then you can keep going and that is how you will upload um, any sort of documents, um, whether it's a downloadable template by us or one that you um, kind of draft on your own, like a letter of support or letter of recommendation. All right. And then we're gonna make our way to the bottom, project impact. These are parts of the scoring criteria. That's all pretty self-explanatory, the project design and feasibility. Um, so these are a lot of places where you can expand verbally on your project. If you're not sure exactly where to include certain information that can um, kind of give us more of an understanding of where your community is and how you are going to be supporting resiliency efforts and climate adaptation efforts um, in section three with the narrative questions is a great place to put those. And then it asks about sharing plan. And then lastly, this additional documentation. Um, so additional uploads are optional and should only be included if they allow reviewers to ass assess your project based on eligibility or scoring criteria outlined in the application questions above. Um, you can upload it here and provide any other relevant details. Um, so then you get down to the bottom of the application. Um, when you finish completing the CRC round one project development grant application, we recommend going back and reviewing your materials and answers to confirm that all attachments are correct, current and appropriately titled. You'll receive an email from an email confirmation when your application has been successfully submitted. And I would uh, check your email to confirm that you've received this receipt. If you do not receive a confirmation email, please check your junk and spam filters for your email account. Um, also check which email you use to set up your submittable account as it might be a different one. And then make sure you successfully submitted the application and it does not remain as a saved draft in your account. Um, if you do not receive the confirmation email, you won't receive any other important information relevant to your CRC round one project development grant application. All right, and I believe that concludes our demo of submittable. So I'll stop sharing and um, start sharing the presentation again to go over last steps and then we'll close out. All right, so here is the updated CRC program timeline. Um, July, 2023, full application materials were released and applications opened. Um, so you could find those applications on the submittable platform for all the CRC grant types. Um, as I mentioned, application materials, instructions and templates are inside the application itself. You can find other guidance documents on the CRC ap uh, application materials webpage. So July through September 2023, our full application webinar series will be released and the CRC team will host virtual office hours throughout the application period. September 18th, 2023, final applications are due for all CRC grant types. And in December 2023, SGC is set to make round one CRC awards. So throughout the application window, like I mentioned, our team will host virtual office hours to support applicants. Um, please note that there are four more audience-specific workshops in the series intended for applicants from rural and tribal communities. So please be mindful of this while registering to attend an office hour session. Please also note that there are a total of four that have been extended to two hours in length each, um, both of them at the end of August and then both at the end of the September, um, the September office hours. Prior registration is encouraged. At the time of registration, you'll be able to submit questions to be answered during the Q&A portion of the office hour. And additionally, you can indicate any translation or interpretation requests during your registration. Again, you can find the full office hour schedule and registration information on the CRC webpage uh, resources page. And lastly, thank you so much. Uh, please contact, with the, contact us with any questions you may have. Our email is down in the video description as well as our webpage and a link to sign up for the CRC email list to receive updates about the program. Additionally, we appreciate you for joining us today and would really like the opportunity to follow up with you to send forthcoming application materials and important updates. So if you have a moment, please take our brief uh, post-webinar survey linked in the video description below. Again, thank you so much for your interest in this exciting new program.